Have you ever made a really serious mistake? You know, one of those that makes your stomach really turn and causes cold sweat to start breaking out all over. Well, the pilots of this Boeing 757 are about to experience exactly this feeling. And when they do, there will be many questions that need to be answered. Stay tuned. In the evening of the 7th of June 2022, two FedEx pilots met up in the crew room in Ontario International Airport, California, United States. They were scheduled for a nighttime pair of flights, initially taking them from Ontario down to Fort Worth Alliance Airport in Texas. And once they reached there, they were then scheduled for a break of around three hours before continuing their duty with a final flight down to Tulsa. The report time was 2050 Central Daylight Time, meaning that a large part of this duty would take place during the window of circadian low. The window of circadian low is something that I've talked about in several of my other videos. It's the time of night when the body temperature drops slightly as it gets ready for its normal period of deep sleep. And if you're not already cozied up in bed at that time, there's an increased risk of fatigue related mistakes happening. Now, Obviously, this doesn't come as a surprise for anyone, least of all for the aviation authorities and the airlines. So in order to allow aircraft to still operate during these hours, there had been risk mitigation strategies implemented. Some of those included a reduced number of total hours that the pilots were allowed to operate and others included active rostering techniques, making sure that the pilots had the chance to get as much rest as required during their duties. But not all duties were equally tiresome to fly, and in order to keep track of the potential fatigue levels of the pilots, FedEx was using a software to calculate each and every pilot's fatigue score according to a model known as the Karolinska Sleepiness Scale, or KSS for short. This scale calculated the potential sleepiness that a pilot might experience during a duty on a scale from 1 to 9, where any result above 7 was considered high risk. If such a score would be found, it would be reviewed by the Fatigue Event Review Committee and then often changed by the rostering department. Now, to establish the score, the KSS took loads of different factors into account, including the opportunity for the pilots to take a nap in between flights if the break was longer than two and a half hours. Facilities were available in the different FedEx hubs for the pilots to go to sleep in a quiet, dark and cool environment, and these facilities were routinely used. Now, the incident flight pairing had received a score of 6.39 according to KSS, but that was providing that both pilots got a quality nap of at least 30 minutes between the flights. This fact, that the nap was included in this calculation, had not been explained to any of the pilots in FedEx. Management later stated that they had been concerned with overburdening the crews with too much information regarding how these scores were actually calculated. Now, can I just say at this point, if there are any managers, aircraft manufacturers or other authorities out there who are concerned about this specific issue, overburdening us pilots with knowledge, that that's not really a thing. We pilots generally enjoy having access to as much information as possible regarding our operations, so don't worry about that, just bring it on. Now, no matter how good a software is, it will never be able to 100% accurately predict how tired a real human being actually is. That's affected by tons of external factors like stress levels, exercise, and even what type of food that the pilot have been eating. So on top of these fatigue models, there were of course also the possibility for the pilots to call in fatigued if they at any point felt that they weren't safe to continue. If a pilot did that, a mandatory fatigue report would have to be filed and the flight would either then be canceled or another pilot might be called in to operate from standby. But this, although not common, did actually happen now and then at FedEx, which is a great sign that people were using the system correctly and that they didn't have any fears of repercussions. In any case, this is a good background knowledge to have when we move forward towards the incident flight. The pilots who were going to operate together on this day were both very experienced. The captain was 57 years old with a total time of well over 10,000 hours, of which around 3,000 had been flown on the Boeing 757, which they were about to operate. He had been working for FedEx for over 10 years at the time of the incident flight, and before FedEx, he had been, among other things, flying the KC-135 AWACS for the US Air Force. His rostered colleague for the day was a 50-year-old first officer who was working his second year with FedEx. 
He had around 4,400 hours of total time and had prior to working for FedEx flown for a short while with American Airlines, as well as 3,300 hours for the US Navy in the AV-8 Bravo Harrier jump jet. So, like I said before, these were two really experienced pilots and they immediately got along very well, even though this was the very first time that they were going to fly together. Once they had introduced themselves, they started going through the weather notams and flight plans for the first flight over towards Fort Worth. Everything looked okay, so they phoned up their dispatch, ordered the fuel and proceeded out to the aircraft where they started setting up for departure. The first officer was elected as pilot flying for the first flight and they ended up departing without any issues on schedule. The aircraft that they were operating was a Boeing 757-236, a beautiful twin-engine jet which is actually one of my personal favorites. It was manufactured back in 1991 and had no open technical issues with it at all. During the flight over towards Fort Worth, the pilots discussed their previous duties and whilst the first officer had managed to get quite a lot of good sleep before these flights, the captain had not been as lucky. He had not been able to sleep very well at all during the preceding days and had already been up for around 7 hours before this first flight started. Now, the flight in itself went off without any type of issues and after landing the pilots walked over to the crew room in Fort Worth where they both checked into their restrooms in order to get some sleep. The first officer quickly dozed off for around 30 minutes but for the captain it was much harder. He tossed and turned for a while but he just couldn't fall asleep. Eventually he simply just gave up and instead went out into the crew room again to start prepping the pre-flight material for the next short leg over towards Tulsa. Now, what he didn't know was that by not getting that little nap, his KSS score had now gone up from 6.39 to 7.4, meaning that he was now in the high risk area for acute fatigue. But he was feeling fine and not particularly tired at all at that point, so he had no thoughts of calling in fatigued. After a while, the first officer joined the captain in the crew room and together they started going through the pre-flight preparation for the second short one hour flight over towards Tulsa. The weather looked fine, except some occasional thunderstorms down towards the south, and there was nothing in the notams that looked like it would cause any type of operational issues either. The captain had flown hundreds of times into Tulsa, and the last time just a few months before, so he felt very confident, and since the first officer had flown the previous leg, the captain would now be pilot flying for this flight. Once they were happy with everything, they walked out towards their gleaming 757 on the apron and started prepping it for the second flight that would now become the incident flight. But before I tell you about what actually happened, there's this. How many of you guys have found your inboxes full of annoying junk mail and scam offers lately? I don't know about you guys, but I literally get tons of this garbage every single day, but I had never really stopped to think, where do these guys actually get my email information from? And I just found out that there are literally companies, data brokers, whose only purpose in life is to sniff the internet for your emails, your family contacts and financial information, and then to sell it on to the highest bidders, which might sometimes include scammers and cyber criminals. They use public records, social media and all of your online activity to find your info. But the funny thing is that you can actually tell them to not do that and they are obliged to listen to you. The problem is of course that to do that will probably take you years and hundreds of hours of work and this is where today's sponsor Incogni comes in. Incogni will reach out to these data brokers on your behalf and then request for your information to be removed from their records. They will also deal with any issues that these companies might throw up and then continue to safeguard your data privacy for as long as your subscription is active. My inbox has become significantly calmer now after only having used Incogni for about a month and if you want to try it for yourself then go to incogni.com pilot. This will give you an exclusive 60% discount on their annual plan which is the same plan that I am using. Thank you Incogni, now back to the video. Once the first officer had come back into the cockpit after his walk around, the captain started briefing for the departure. They were expecting a purple tree departure from runway 16 left and after that hopefully a right turn towards Tulsa. This was a really short flight, so they were not expecting to climb higher than flight level 310, which is about 31,000 feet. Once all of the cockpit preparation was completed, they asked for push and start about 7 minutes before their scheduled departure time and started taxiing out towards runway 16 left. 
The cockpit conversation was laid back and friendly and the captain was relaxed because he had found the first officer to be highly competent. The takeoff was completely normal and as expected they received an early right turn towards Tulsa just after departure and after several climb clearances they were finally cleared to flight level 310 which the captain pointed out they would just barely reach before they would have to start descending again. As they were climbing, the first officer went away from the active frequency to get the latest weather for their destination. It was a nice day with covering clouds about 5,500 feet, a few lower clouds around, good visibility and light wind from the northeast. Runway 18 left was in use for landing and when all of this had been copied, the first officer then returned back to the frequency and briefed the captain on what he had heard. Now, before we go any further, there are a few things that you need to understand for this story to make any kind of sense to you. To start off with, we need to talk about the Tulsa airport. It is located about 5 miles northeast of Tulsa City in Oklahoma and has three active runways. Runway 18 left, 36 right, which is 10,000 feet or 3,048 meters long and equipped with full approach lights, centerline lights and precision approach path indicators or POPIS on the left hand side. And then we have the parallel runway, 18 right, 36 left, which is significantly shorter, only 6,101 feet or 1,860 meters. Runway 18 right also has poppies on the left side, but it has no centerline lights or approach lights, and on top of being much shorter, it also has a 600 feet or 180 meters displaced threshold, meaning that the available landing distance is more like 5,500 feet or 1,680 meters. Now, that's a pretty short runway to land an airliner on, and for that reason, runway 18 left would be the landing runway. In between the two parallel runways was also a 7,376 feet long crossing runway called 0826, but that one will not be relevant for this story. On duty in Tulsa Tower on this morning was only one controller. Now, that would be pretty normal since the traffic density at these early hours of the day was very light and her role in this story will soon become quite important. The other thing that I need to explain is a system that I haven't actually mentioned in my earlier video so far and that system is called Runway Awareness and Advisory System or RAS for short. This is a fairly new system that larger aircraft have recently started to be equipped with and it's actually an enhancement to the already existing ground proximity and warning system. The way that it works is by using the position of the aircraft in relation to a digital database of terrain and airport information to produce oral callouts, advising us pilots about where we are together with a slew of other types of warnings. An example could be that if we are taxiing towards a runway, for example, runway 18 right, as we're getting closer, a RAS voice will call out Approaching 18 right. And this call out will hopefully help avoid inadvertent runway incursions, like the one that caused the Linate airport disaster, for example, which I covered in a previous video. RAS also alerts us if we're about to start a takeoff on a taxiway, for example, and in some models, it also calls out if we've forgotten to select flaps as we're taking off, along with many other things. It is a <laughs> really fantastic system and in the air it will also provide similar warnings like long landing go around if we don't touch down where we are supposed to as well as identifying the runway we're approaching by calling out approaching 18 left the aircraft in the story was equipped with RAS and both pilots were familiar with this system when the captain had received the weather from the first officer, the aircraft had just leveled off at flight level 310 and literally just a minute later, the first officer asked their traffic control if they could start the descent. Now, some of you might ask why an aircraft are planned to climb that high if all they will be able to do up there is literally to start descending again. Well, the fact is that the most economical flight profile is actually a parable meaning that the aircraft climbs on climb thrust up as high as it can and then immediately starts its descent down towards the destination airport. So this flight was actually as close to optimum as they could get. A downside of this though is that things like the approach briefing will have to be done in either the climb or descent, which is not particularly optimal and that's exactly what happened here. The aircraft started descending and as it did so, the first officer did the required landing performance calculation for the arrival runway, runway 18 left. It quickly became clear that the landing distance was not going to be a problem since the runway was over 3 kilometers long. This prompted the captain to decide that he wanted the auto brake system, 
system that actually applies brakes automatically to remain off as the FedEx stands were located to the left side at the end of runway 18 left and he wanted to maintain a nice smooth rollout all the way down there. The first officer agreed to this and then proceeded to help the captain to set up the inbound ILS frequencies. After that the captain briefed the way that he wanted to fly the approach and his plan was to fly a visual approach into runway 18 left backed up by the ILS for verification. A visual approach is an approach that should be flown based on outside visual references primarily. In order to do this, the airport and runway environment must be clearly in sight for both pilots throughout the whole maneuver and according to FedEx procedures, all visual approaches must be backed up by any available nav aids and in this case that was an ILS. And as it turns out, there are really good reasons for that. As they were now descending, the crew had earlier been cleared direct towards the Tulsa VOR and in a straight line, but obviously that's not what they would actually end up doing. At some point they would need to start receiving radar vectors towards the ILS approach and because of this they needed to update their FMS routes to show something that was a bit more realistic, to basically get the correct amount of track miles. They started by creating a waypoint about 30 miles from the airport and then connected that to the ILS approach. They then put a hard altitude restriction of 11,000 feet at that waypoint which would correspond well to the anticipated descent profile. In any case, the captain finished off the approach briefing with explaining that he would use flaps 30 for landing which would give an approach speed of 123 knots. And he also said that in case of a missed approach they would request to climb straight ahead instead of following the published missed approach procedure which would instruct them to turn back towards the Tulsa VOR. The first officer had no further questions to that briefing and apart from some occasional yawns, the cockpit voice recorder just picked up some common chatter, typical for colleagues who are enjoying each other's company and doing the job the way they should. When the aircraft descended through around 10,000 feet, the en route air traffic control center handed the aircraft over to the Tulsa tower controller. When they called in, she told them that they could expect vectors for a visual approach for runway 18 left, that they should descend to 6,000 feet and to turn onto a heading of 360 degrees for a right hand downwind. The first officer read this back and the captain turned the heading knob, so the aircraft started turning. Now they were still inside the clouds at this point, so they could therefore not see the airport yet. The captain asked the first officer to continue to modify the routing to correspond with the new routing that they had just received. He asked to insert a direct routing towards an RNAV point called Owaso and then connect that with the ILS final approach fix. That should give them a good approximation of the track miles that they had left. The controller now cleared the aircraft to descend further, to 3,500 feet and then to 2,500 feet based on a pressure setting of 29.86 inches of mercury. And as the aircraft descended through around 5,500 feet, they broke through the clouds and could finally start to see the lights from the ground below them. The first officer started looking for the airport, which the controller had advised them would be in their 2 o'clock position, but initially he couldn't see it and this was because, like the captain pointed out, that the airport is always located in the darkest part of the landscape. Basically, to find an airport in a city environment from the air, you just look at where there's a big black hole in all of the surrounding lights, that's likely where the airport is going to be. I clearly remember this myself from when I was doing my visual nighttime training and this might sound a little bit strange for people who are not flying because most of us associate airports with a lot of different types of taxiway, runway and approach lights, but what you might not think about is that the omnidirectional parts of those lights are deliberately set to a quite low intensity to not interfere with the pilot's nighttime vision. The only lights who are really bright on an airport tends to be the directional part of the approach and runway lights, but those are, like the name suggests, directional, meaning that they can only be seen well when you're facing the approach direction and when you're within a certain amount of degrees. The poppies and the airport beacon also tends to be easy to spot with the beacons normally set on top of the uh, control tower and it's flashing at regular intervals. And this beacon, that was exactly what the pilots finally saw which helped them to identify where the airport was. From their perspective, their position looked good for a normal right downwind for the runway even though they still couldn't see the actual runway or approach lights. But at time 0407, the captain suddenly exclaimed, there it is, right there, indicating that he now had what he thought was the landing runway in sight. 
The first officer still didn't see it properly, but when the captain asked him to tell the controller that they had the runway in sight, which is the phraseology normally used to request a visual approach, he went along with it and called it in. The controller responded by first clearing FedEx Flight 1170 for a visual approach, runway 18 left, and then she gave them the wind of 050 degrees at 6 knots and also cleared them to land. From her position in the tower, she could see the aircraft on the downwind, but when they started turning right for a base leg, she also received a call from another aircraft on the apron who wanted taxi instructions. And since there were no other traffic in the area, she didn't look back at the FedEx aircraft again after this, and that will turn out to have consequences. In the cockpit, the captain asked for flaps 1 as soon as the landing clearance had been received and started to decelerate the aircraft. He had leveled off at 2,500 feet as instructed, but when they were cleared for the visual approach, the first officer reset the MCP altitude to 2,400 feet, which was the minimum altitude at the final approach fixed for the approach, and the captain started a slow descent using vertical speed. Whilst he was still looking at the runway, he now also started a right turn for base and asked for flaps 5 to be selected. The approach mode was also armed to enable capturing of the localizer and glide slope beams, and when the glide slope was captured, the aircraft started pitching down to follow it. But the localizer indicator, which shows how the aircraft needs to turn in order to follow the lateral localizer beam down towards the runway, was still showing that they needed to continue further to the left at that point. Now it's probably worth discussing what kind of indications that the pilots had in front of them at this point. On both of the pilot's primary flight displays, the flight mode annunciator, the FMA at the top, would have indicated what modes that the autopilot was following. At this point of the approach, it would have showed that the auto throttle was in speed mode, followed by heading hold for lateral guidance with the localizer armed in white, meaning that it would engage as soon as the localizer beam was captured, but that it hadn't captured it yet. To the right of that, the glide slope would have been shown as captured in green, and that would provide horizontal guidance down. Now, this is a quite odd combination of modes, because normally, when an ILS is being flown, the localizer would be intercepted first, and then the glide slope. On the Boeing 737 that I fly, the glide slope won't even capture if the localizer hasn't already been captured before. Below the FMA, the flight director bars would have shown a very similar story. The aircraft would have been initially following the horizontal bar correctly, but the vertical bar would have been far to the left, and this would have been explained by the localizer diamond below the horizon indicator showing full left deflection. So why was this not noticed by the pilots? Well, that was likely down to two different reasons. The captain was now flying a visual approach, meaning that he was using mainly outside visual cues for his navigation. And he could clearly see the runway lights and especially the pop is next to the runway, and that's what he was actually aiming for. On top of this, the aircraft was equipped with something called a head-up display, or hood, on the captain's side. This is basically a prism that will project a similar picture as the primary flight display is showing on a see-through screen in front of the captain. Now this is a great aid, as it enables pilots to basically both look outside and inside on the instruments at the same time, but on the hood, instead of a flight director, a much smaller green circle, known as a command indicator, will instead be shown. This circle is considerably less conspicuous than the flight director bars, and if the captain would have focused his main attention outside of the screen, which he likely did, then this could have easily been ignored. Now, both the localizer and glide slope indicators was also shown on the head-up display, but this will actually soon become a source of further confusion rather than a help for the pilots. When it came to the first officer, he didn't have a head-up display on his side, so he should have been able to see that odd indication on his primary flight display. But as they were now turning inbound, he was probably busy extending more flaps and looking at the coming landing checklist, and since he could also see the runway and the poppies at this point, he likely wasn't looking so closely on the navigational instruments. Now, both of them also had a navigation display, which was showing an overhead chart picture of what was going on, but like I said, they were looking outside and they were not paying attention to this. The captain now asked for flaps 15 to be selected, followed by flaps 20, before he suddenly disconnected the autopilot. 
And the reason that he disconnected the autopilot that early was likely because of the fact that what he was seeing on the glide slope indicator didn't match what he was seeing outside on the poppy lights. The glide slope was saying that he was perfectly on path, but the poppies was saying that he was way too low showing four red lights. Now, as a pilot, you never want to fly an approach from four red poppy lights. So to sort this out, he disconnected and momentarily reduced his descent rate in order to align himself with the poppies instead. As I'm sure most of you have guessed by now, what had actually happened here was that the aircraft had now turned right to visually line up with runway 18 right, rather than runway 18 left. The ILS, which was tuned, was of course set to the correct runway, and since that runway was both longer and located closer to the aircraft, its glide slope was situated lower down in this position than the poppy angle for the shorter runway was. On top of that, runway 18 right also had that displaced threshold, putting the poppies even further away and therefore the approach path higher up. This discrepancy was quite considerable and both pilots did comment on the fact that it looked like the glide slope and the poppies were misaligned, but here you can see how powerful confirmation and planned continuation bias can be. Basically, when we humans have decided on a specific plan, it will take a lot of inputs to make us deviate from that plan, especially since our minds also tend to stick to our initial picture of what's going on, even if multiple signs point to it being wrong. These biases are often even stronger when we're tired or working during the window of circadian law, which these pilots were. In any case, the aircraft continued to descend, now following the poppies rather than the glide slope. The localizer had never been captured and continued showing full deflection left. The captain asked for the landing checklist to be completed and the first officer started challenging it according to their normal procedures. When they passed 1000 feet, the GPWS called out 1000 and since the aircraft was fully stabilized, visually on track and on the poppies, the crew saw no reason to not continue the approach. The fact that the runway that they were approaching was lacking both approach and centerline lights were not picked up either. Now, those of you who have been paying attention up until now would probably ask, well, what about that RAS system that you talked about before? Shouldn't it say something? And that's a good question. Because at time 04, 11 and 42 seconds, the RAS could actually be heard on the cockpit voice recorder calling out, Approaching 18 right. But at that same time, the pilots were discussing the fact that they had a bit of tailwind and that the command and speed needed to be slightly adjusted, as well as some other comments regarding being slightly low on the poppies. So that call out was either ignored, missed or misunderstood. The controller in the tower was, like I mentioned earlier, not looking at the aircraft at this point, since she was dealing with some other traffic on the apron. And if she would have, she would have definitely seen what was about to happen, but from here on, there was very little other things that could change it. The pilots kept commenting on the strange misalignment between the poppies and the glide slope, but curiously, no one mentioned the localizer at all. When the aircraft GPWS called out 500, the first officer said, you're stable and clear to land, and this was the last procedural prompt available for him to question the position of the aircraft, but it was sadly also missed. They kept descending, and at time 04, 12 and 34 seconds, the captain commented, um, the glide slope came back, it's all over the place, isn't it? Now, this likely coincided with the point they passed the glide slope antenna on the runway that they were actually supposed to land on. Eight seconds later, the outer throttle was disconnected, and the GPWS started calling out 100, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 followed by the sound of the aircraft touching down. The first officer called out, spoilers deployed, but that was almost immediately followed by a RAS call that you do not want to hear directly off the landing. 3,000 feet remaining. Now, remember that the crew had elected to not use outer brakes because they had this long 10,000 feet runway to slow down on? Well, this was obviously no longer the case, so the captain, who now understood that something was seriously wrong, started applying heavy braking. The GPWS continued calling out 2,000 remaining, 1,000 remaining, whilst the aircraft was decelerating so hard that the first officer missed calling out 80 knots and instead called out, uh, missed 80, here is 60 instead. Luckily, the runway was dry, meaning that it had excellent braking action, and on that type of a surface, even a large aircraft like the Boeing 757 can come to a stop very quickly. Once the aircraft had finally reached taxi speed, the captain said, 
um, are we on the correct runway? The first officer, who still hadn't figured out what had happened, responded, uh, one eight left. But the captain just continued, what the f... We landed on the right runway, followed by some more cursing. When he realized that, the first officer just responded, oh god. And I can just clearly imagine that cold feeling in the pit of their stomachs when it dawned on them the, the full scale of the mistake that they had just made. Anyway, they then called up the tower controller and explained that they had actually landed on runway 18 right instead of 18 left and requested taxi clearance towards the FedEx hangar. The controller responded and gave them the required taxi instructions, likely with a similar feeling in her stomach. Now, during the way in, the pilots showed signs of some real professionalism as they were taxiing. They obviously adhered to standard operating procedures when it came to the taxi navigation and sterile cockpit, but the first officer also looked up all of the different reports that they would now have to write. The captain specified that they needed to write one report each and not to try to influence each other to make sure that the investigators would get two separate accounts of what had happened. Once the aircraft had reached the gate and was properly shut down, the captain then contacted the relevant company representatives and then made sure that the cockpit voice recorder was removed so it would not be overwritten. And that's why we have all of their discussions available to the investigation. Altogether, this was a very professional way to handle a very bad situation. This incident was found to be caused by the flight crew's misidentification of the intended landing runway and contributing to the incident were the pilot's failure to perceive and correctly interpret all visual and auditory indicators, including all of the electronic guidance that was available to them. This was likely the result of a degradation in cognitive function brought on by working within the window of circadian low, increased workload and fatigue. The air traffic controller's failure to monitor the arriving flight after issuing their landing clearance was also seen as a contributing factor. Now, there were no immediate recommendations issued by this report, but I have one myself. If you're operating flights at times like this or doing any type of job during similar circumstances, recognize that the likelihood of making errors are much higher than normal, so try to make your life as uncomplicated as possible. That includes discussing fatigue as a threat in a formal threat and error briefing before an approach, and doing that will make the pilot monitoring more vigilant to so hopefully catch any errors that might occur. Also, if you're flying, consider flying a fully vectored standard ILS approach instead of a visual approach to make your life a little bit easier. I promise you, this will avoid a lot of unnecessary grey hairs. Now, check out these videos next, and if you want to support the work of my team and I, consider becoming a member of my awesome Patreon crew, or buy yourself a t-shirt, mug, or a hoodie using the links below. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.